officer who, as a full-time peace activist, has served as president of the Maine State's chapter of Veterans for Peace and has taught peace and has taught in the Peace and Reconciliation Department at the University of Maine. As a student of the consequences of US militarism, he has traveled to meet and stand in solidarity with its victims, including Marshall Islanders, Koreans, Vietnamese, the Inuit of Greenland, and the, Ch the Chagos of Diego Garcia. In 1998, he traveled with a group of disabled veterans and former enemy combatants. Dud's brief military career included a volunteer tour in Vietnam. On a, he joined them on a healing bicycle ride from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City, what he calls a transformative experience. When Dud is not involved in matters of world peace and reconciliation, he takes pride in thinking that he has had some impact on over 8,000 young players, aspiring players, who have gone through his lacrosse camp. Founded in 1976 and still operating at the Cardigan Mountain School in Canaan, New Hampshire. Please welcome Dud Hendrick. Thank you. Well, I'm in awe of my uh, co-presenters. Uh, given the subject of the last four of us this evening, I think there's an ominous problem on the horizon. On April 27th, along with 24 others, I was arrested at Bath Ironworks for obstructing traffic entering the shipyard for a christening ceremony of a destroyer, the LBJ. It was the beginning of a campaign calling on our congressional delegation to redirect funds from building warships to building sustainable energy systems at Bath. As you heard, I've graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1963, taking a commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. I'd entered the academy proudly, never considering the real consequences of that decision. Everything I'd seen and heard led me to believe that military service was noble and reflected only honorably on me and my family. In 1964, I was sent to Thule, Greenland as a nuclear weapons officer. Decades later, I would learn that Inuit natives had been displaced by the construction of the base. This knowledge that they were given four days to pack up and get out would mark the beginning of my distrust in American exceptionalism. In January of 1966, my best friend was shot down and killed in Vietnam. In grief, I volunteered and was sent nine months later. Ultimately, 58,000 American lives were lost and two to three million Vietnamese. My 13 classmates who died probably knew no more about Vietnam or why we were there than I, not much. I returned home, attended graduate school, and busied myself with career and family, virtually putting away the war until learning of Veterans for Peace. Founded in Maine in 1985, it now has 140 chapters. We are dedicated to the abolishment of war as an instrument of national policy. Woo! In, in 1998, I participated in the Vietnam Challenge, a bicycle ride from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City comprised of veterans from both sides of the war, most of whom had been grievously wounded, amputees, paraplegics, blind, brain injury victims. As you've heard, it was a transformative experience. Riding with former mortal enemies, there were tears every day and night as we came to know one another as brothers and sisters, all victims of war. An award-winning documentary, Vietnam Long Time Coming, conveyed the discovery of our shared humanity. I would return to Vietnam once with Habitat for Humanity and twice to work with victims of Agent Orange. Today, two to three million Vietnamese are institutionalized, unable to take care of themselves as a consequence of this most cruel legacy of the war. Vietnam's soils and waters are poison for generations to come. My dawning awareness of the costs of war led to a subsequent focus on the displacement of indigenous peoples. In 1946, the people of Bikini Atoll were asked by American authorities to leave their island for the good of mankind. The island remains radioactive and uninhabitable today. Elsewhere in the Marshall Islands is a so-called Ronald Reagan Missile Defense Site on Kwajalein. 
Islanders who work there commute from nearby Ebai Island. Known as the slum of the Pacific, it is the most densely populated place on earth. 15,000 people on 80 acres, many of them refugees of the atomic bomb testing. In 2008, I returned to Greenland to learn more of the displacement forced by Thule. I met with Usakak Kawakitsak, the leader of the Inuits, who continued to demand return to their ancestral lands. Louise's mother wept as she shared with me her memory of her parents crying as they were forced to abandon their homes by Americans. I learned that a B-52 carrying nuclear weapons had crashed on the ice cap in 1968 while attempting an emergency landing at Thule. I visited Simakok, one of the 18 Inuits hired in the cleanup operation. One of the bombs had never been recovered, mutant wildlife has been found, the land remains contaminated, and the other 17 Inuits were deceased, causes unknown. I next visited British Parliament, where I stood in solidarity with the Chagos people of Diego Garcia, a remote island in the Indian Ocean. British and American forces had removed these people in the 1960s to enable the construction of a huge U.S. military base. I interviewed Lizette Talate, a leader of the Chagosians campaign seeking return. In 2012, Lizette had died of Sagrin, the Chagos word for profound sorrow or broken heart. The base continues to launch U.S. aircraft for bombing sorties nearly every day, and the U.S. and U.K. still deny the Chagos the right to return. I've continued my study of places around a planet garrisoned by U.S. military bases. We have over 800 in more than 70 countries, while the rest of the world's countries have less than 30 total. A host of reasons make these bases unwelcome. Pollution, crime, accidents, and an inherent undermining of local sovereignty. But it is militarism's biggest consequence of all that now has my attention, the elephant in the room. The Pentagon has the largest carbon footprint on the planet. It generates the majority of our country's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. It uses more oil than is consumed in 175 countries. These are the voices of others who were arrested at the christening, Connie Jenkins. It is not sufficient to write letters to our representatives and visit congressional offices. We don't have time for business as usual. Climate change is the existential threat to most life on Earth. If future generations are to have a future, we must be in the streets. And Russell Ray. BIW built destroyers are outfitted with sonar whose use destroys the lives of countless whales, dolphins, and other marine life. These are destroyers in the truest sense of the word. And Rob Shetterly. As kids, we laughed at the notion that explorers feared the world was flat and that they might sail over the edge. The politicians, the corporatists, and the war profiteers have indeed made it flat and now we've sailed to the brink. The kids aren't laughing. Our planet hangs in the balance. Conversion at Bath can create more jobs while benefiting our planet. Our campaign stands with Greta Thunberg and with our next speaker, Anna Siegel, and the Extinction Rebellion, and 350.org, and the Sunrise Movement, and the Green New Deal. There's another christening coming on June 22nd. I would hope that you all might be able to join us on that day. We have brochures in the back of the room. Please pick one up. Thanks so much.